So I was digging around for some watermelon radishes this mm -hmm. morning. Show them the show. I found this guy. We'll talk about him in just a minute. Anyway, some nice looking watermelon radishes. Now, we've had some spurts of some heavy, heavy rain. And uh, I got you right here. And these things haven't cracked yet, which I'm surprised. As much heavy rain as we have, you would have thought they would have cracked. Let's see what they look like here. Look there. Oh, ain't they pretty? Pretty, pretty, pretty on the inside there. Let and, me see uh, it. Cut you a little. Cut me a little piece too while you at it. Or I, I'll, I'll, I'll snack on this one. You get on, you, you get on your own. I get my own over here. Okay. So that one there, you can see they're consistently nice there. And these have a little less bite than traditional radish. In fact, that right there really ain't got any bite at all. It's almost sweet tasting, ain't it? That's good. You've never grown watermelon radishes before, folks. It's a nice thing. If you just got a spot, about a three foot, you know, spot for a row where you get, really ain't got nothing else you can throw in there. Uh, good little thing to put. I direct seeded these. Um, I've never transplanted radishes and uh, I don't know if I'd recommend doing it, but you can direct seed these. They take a little longer than normal radishes because you let them get bigger. Um, these take about 50, 60 days. So what I did is I planted a half row of these and a half row of the, was it tombstone, touchstone? Touchstone, gold beets. That's beets, ain't it? I did plant two different kinds of radish and I can't remember the other type I planted. Now this one here, I don't know how it got in the mix, but I'm guessing this is one of our purple plum radishes. This is what it looks like. It doesn't look like any red varieties. It looks like a purple plum radish to me. And you see that one there looks pretty on the I inside. don't believe it's quite as red as what this one is. Uh -uh. It's got some kind of blue. Or this could be some crazy hybridized thing that, that was created in my garden. Who knows? But uh, let's see if it tastes. What you think here? That one's got more bite to it, which makes me think that's one of them purple plum ones that got too big. Oh, I what agree. Is, yeah, it's a little hot there. But it's, the crazy thing is you're not really supposed to let that variety get that big or else it get pithy, but that one's not really mm, pithy. It's not. Um, I prefer the taste of the watermelon radish. This myself. is about, I'm going to pull most of mine this weekend. That's about the right, just the right size in my opinion. Well, we got a mess here. We do got a mess. We're going to have a mess. I didn't bring any paper towels. Um, one more thing I brought here. I got lots of things. You got lots, don't Lots you? of things this week. So, beets. Y'all watch the show much, you know I grow lots and lots of beets. We like beets. Let me see if I can clean this off a little bit. This is the Kyogia variety. Now, it looks like it's pronounced Chiogia, but it's actually pronounced Kyogia. And, oh man. Cool. So, those kind of look like a candy cane on the, in the middle there. And for those of you who don't really appreciate the real earthy flavor of beets, these right here are supposed to have a little less earthy kind of uh, what some people call dirt flavor to them. And uh, I figured we'd uh, see if you could verify that for us. Well, there's one thing I don't care for is raw beets. Now, I love them cooked, but I don't care for them raw. You don't like them raw? No. Well, you got, you just got but to But I'm going to take one for the team. You but I, take for the, cut me a piece. I, I don't really care for them raw. You peel them? Well, I'm going to. I washed them good. They're clean. It's all right. I ain't sure how, I ain't sure, too sure how clean my knife is. That's normally not nothing I care for. Now it still tastes like a beet. It does, but they better cook than me. But uh, I will say, yeah, they don't have quite as an earthy flavor. Now I can eat a radish roll, but it's got a good bit of sugar That's content pretty. to that. That's pretty. That's sweet. Um, um, boil them up, some chicken broth. Hey, it'd be some good stuff there. I got a bunch of these growing in the greenhouse. You said you wanted a bunch of beets, so I got a bunch of these that are getting close. Um, 
to being ready uh, to transplant. So you'll have plenty of them growing. Uh, pickle some, boil some, however you like to cook them. What you got? Oh, Rob, what I got. Look at here, what I got. So, a couple of weeks ago, I showed y'all with my big, remember them big old cabbages I grew? Yeah. Speaking of that. I uh, made me some sauerkraut, and it's been two weeks today. Time to try it. And I figure it's time to partake. Mmm, I'm a little nervous. There's a weight in there. I got to get it out. We sell these here you kits. Don't eat that weight. All right. We sell these here kits. It's ferment kits and everything you need besides the jars in that kit. And the cabbage. And the cabbage. But we do sell the cabbage. And we do sell the cabbage. You want me to try it first? You gonna try? I want to go first. We should have brought some hot dogs, some sausage dogs. Is it all the way there? Is it? Is it soured? I messed up, didn't I? I don't believe you did something right there. I got too much salt in it. Well, you there you was. There I was preaching that, to everybody about the salt. Talking about how thing. Alabama folks can't do math. And I don't believe you can do math. Either. I had got too much salt in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's okay, but it's bad salt in it. <laughs> that dry you up. I'm going to go back and redo that. Yeah. I ain't sure my dog would eat that. <laughs> If he did, he'd be dried up, shriveled up. Ooh, that's worse. You know, you ever eat fried fish and then you thirsty all night long? You want to get it right? Ooh, that's just worse than that. That's about like getting you a swallow of ocean water. We're going to put that back up, y'all. <laughs> that didn't turn out as well as old Greg expected. Maybe we need uh, Ooh, that's bad salt. Maybe we need a little help from our viewers. It ain't bad. It's just the salty. You can't eat it. <laughs> That old boy told me, he said, whatever you do, measure that salt out, and I would not do it. I just had to pour it in there that I thought it was about right, and I knew I had messed up. So I shredded me up, more cabbage, put in there trying to dilute it down, but I couldn't get it there. You're too much salt in there. So, you was talking about cabbage Woo! the other week, and your personal size cabbage, and you was claiming that I was, uh-oh, uh what just happened there? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So, Uh-oh. Something's coming to get us. Ooh. Sure as the world, something's going to come and get us. I can't nobody see my cabbage. <laughs> that gummy. I better see what's going on. Uh-oh. I bet y'all was getting worried about us there for a little bit. <laughs> we are back. And that is what happens when you live out in the boonies. Anything can happen and the power can go out. Scared me so bad I had to go change clothes. <laughs> We uh, we usually shoot this show on Wednesdays, and uh, the power went out. That's why we're in different clothes, and uh, we're back here uh, trying to trying to kind of patch this together. So just bear with us for a minute. We had talked about your salty sauerkraut. How that wasn't any bad, good. Bad, 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 and, uh, bad, bad, bad. I felt bad for you, and uh, I felt bad for you. And last week you was claiming that I was making my cabbage look bigger than they actually were. So I wanted to bring one of my Rio Grands there. And you can hold that rascal. I believe it weighs about 15, uh, 15 20 pounds, what you think? Pretty good size for a big old gaudy cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably closer to probably about six or seven pounds. But anyway, I brought you some of this. I figured this would make some real I'm gonna give it another try, and I'm gonna measure my salt this time. Measure your salt, and, and this is gonna make some real pretty sauerkraut, and uh, don't mess it up, because I work real hard on this cabbage. Okay. I got a lot of love into that, and um, I, I don't know if you can tell on camera. Travis, folks, we, got, we got this a big cabbage. Uh, we got it. That's between a volleyball and a basketball. Uh, You're going to fondle that cabbage till it rots. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> okay, so uh, what else do we got going on here? Lots of stuff to get to. Uh, we had a lot of people within the last week or so uh, commenting on our videos about our accents. Really? Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, even had some people being kind of rude in comments saying uh, we had a BS hillbilly accent. and uh, That's no need in all that. No, there ain't no need in all that. We don't make fun of them folks up north that's got them northern accents. No, no. And, and uh, believe it or not, we don't, when we talk, we don't understand. It doesn't come, we don't hear our accents. So you're the only one to hear it. It doesn't bother us because we don't hear them. Right. And I think I talk as normal as anybody does. 
Yeah, and and I I know I know this because I have to watch this over when I'm editing it uh, to get it ready to post. I I'm not the world's best at enunciating. I can sound like a 1990s NASCAR driver naming out all those car sponsors sometimes. And uh, and just if you just you bear might, with us, we're not doing to, it on purpose. They it's have just, to hit the pause button and replay a piece or two if you don't understand. Us. But it's all in context. Hopefully, it all makes sense for you. Uh, well, one more thing. We made a little boo boo last week. Okay. And we mentioned something about some gypsies, and there was a lady emailed us and told us that her aunt got offended by this. Now, what we didn't know, which, and she pointed out in this long length of email, which was very good information, that gypsies is actually a slur word or a racist, racist, there I go again, racial racist, slur. racial slur. And that gypsies pertains to an ethnic group of people. See, I didn't know that. I did. She sent us some links, and I did a little research. And it is not uh, a proper language. And it offended her aunt because her aunt was Romania descended. Romani. The, Romani. 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 Yeah. Anyway, what I wanted to say was we did not. Uh, we, it was not our intentions to offend anybody. And if we did, we sorry we did. But. I mean, they've been songs written about the word gypsies and other things, too. We just didn't know that, and it was ignorant on our part. And if we offended anybody, we are sorry. If anybody knows, Trav and I, we're just as good-hearted, and we don't never want to offend anybody, and it's not in our DNA to do that. So if we did offend you, we're sorry. Now let's move on from that. Right, right. I'm not going to use the, the G word anymore? No more G word. Nope. Uh, well, she she told me in the email, she said we should refer to them as traveling con men and not the G word. See, that's where I got confused because I thought it was a group of people instead of a group of ethnic race. Yeah. There's a lot to it. They, you if you want to do some it. research on it, it's kind of interesting. So anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. Um, I, I have mentioned that uh, I'm going to be at uh, Deep South Homestead's get-together, which is in um, these dates as y'all get is March 21st, I think, somewhere around there. Uh, <clears throat> a couple weeks later, those of you, and that's in Mississippi, a couple of weeks later, those of you that are out in the Arkansas, Missouri area, uh, another channel we partner with, a pretty big channel called Roots and Refuge. If you haven't heard of them, go check them out. But they, they partner with another channel called VW Family Farm and have an event called the Shindig. It's a two-day event, uh, music, talks, uh, all kind of good stuff out there, seed swap. And uh, so I'll be at that event. That is April 3rd and 4th, and that is in Searcy, Arkansas. Uh, so I'll be flying in Little Rock and uh, driving up about an hour there uh, to go to that. So if you're in that area, I'll try to put a link below to that event so you can uh, register for that. But uh, come out and see me. Love to meet you guys and talk with you. A few more things. In addition to the um, the accents, we had a lot of people that have been fussing about my video titling on YouTube mm. and, and complaining about the clickbait titles. You've been doing clickbait? <clears throat> well, I do it a little bit. And, and I will tell you this, folks. If I title a video, Garden Tour or Walk Around the Garden, nobody will ever see it. And uh, until clickbait quits working we got to keep using it it's one of the only ways to really get your videos put in front of people who don't already know who you are it's unfortunate that's the way it is but at some point somebody started using clickbait and then everybody else had to do it or and else. now youtube feeds off that so right so it's actually youtube's yeah, fault it's yeah. not your fault right it's the way I look so at some it. people understand it it's just part of the game some people it really really gets under the skin well, well you don't do it to irritate nobody i don't do it to irritate nobody our whole goal here is to spread the garden and love around the world we just want to help people and just want to help people and the more help. people we can get to see our videos the more people we can help Last thing, and I don't know if you've watched the video yet, the that cover crop cocktail I did and tilled in, man. It, I've been uh, shipping taters, Trail, in case you didn't know. But, but, from sun up to sundown and after that. Well, when you get time, that, that daikon radish vetch, I was amazed at how much biomass that vetch Well, produced. I got out there over the weekend and did the same thing to mine, and I worked mine in. I'm going to tell you, that is awesome. And that daikon works in so easy. Yeah, somebody commented on the video and they said, 
man, that all that biomass that looks like that's gonna take a couple months to break down, but it actually breaks down quick. I, that video was shot on a Sunday, this past Sunday. I tilled it once in. I tilled it two days ago, one more time, and shoot it. I could plant taters in it if it was dry yeah, that, tomorrow. To me, the daikon radish breaks down quicker and more easily than any of the rest of our winter cover crops. It now, I don't want to say it has more biomass, right. but it breaks down. It has, just has different attributes than some of the others, doesn't it? If you got one that you got to, you got to get out of there quick and move around, your daikon radish will work better for you, faster transition, cutting it in and being able to plant back. But that winter pea and the vetch and the daikon together work perfect. First time I've done that, and if yeah. I can, if I can if I can get my ratio, I'm play with a little bit, get my ratios just right, I might make me a little mixture and sell that on the site. Makes a little mixture. Okay, last thing before we get into our main topic this week. All, every week I've been showing people new seed varieties we got here. And I got some new stuff this week. Squash in particular. Squash and zucchini. And uh, it almost looks like, <clears throat> I won't say for sure, we might be in the clear on the frost thing. Ooh, but it, you don't. Ooh, we always get something late February. Yeah, you you go too early on that deal. I'm just saying there's a chance. There's a slim, slim but I ain't chance. saying I'm a plant squash no, yet. No, no, no. But come middle March, I'll be planting. Oh squash. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it won't be long. Yeah, yeah. So I got four new varieties here I want to show everybody. This first one here is called Gentry, and you might have heard of this before. This is what they call semi crook neck squash, and it's really really productive. It's going to outproduce your bumpy old school crook neck squash it is a hybrid and it's about 45 44 to 45 days yeah, to maturity. So it's got smooth skin on it a real real good variety now if you live in an area where you have some disease issues some heat and humidity you want to kick it up a notch and go with this gold star right here so this gold star is a semi crook neck and it's going to look a lot like the gentry as far as the fruit goes but this gold star is powdery mildew resistant. And mosaic virus. And mosaic virus. And I'll tell resistant. you where this is gonna come in handy. This one right here is gonna come in handy for a late planting of squash when you run into the middle of the summertime. When you're pushing it on into June, July. Yeah, so you can plant the gentry any of them in early spring. When you move into that later planting of squash, this gold star would be my go-to on that. And we, we usually can get three to four rounds oh, yeah. of squash. Yeah, we could plant, I could plant that in first of June and make it. The next one is, I want to talk about, is this Pascola zucchini. So I got two varieties of green zucchini here with exceptional, I'm talking about, won't find anywhere else disease resistant. So this Pascola here is resistant to powdery mildew, cucumber mosaic, watermelon mosaic, zucchini yellow mosaic, and, excuse me, yeah, those four. Cucumber mosaic, watermelon mosaic, zucchini yellow mosaic, and powdery mildew. Mosaics. Mosaics. A very, very strong disease package on that. Another one that's going to let you grow squash later in the warmer months. Than or you in want. the fall. Or if you want to grow in the fall of the year, you want to put one of these disease resistant ones because we have powdery mildew and mosaic horribly in the fall. And the last one here I'll talk about squash wise is called Spineless Supreme Zucchini. So we have Spineless Beauty. The Spineless Supreme is completely spineless. That means it's a little easier to harvest. It ain't gonna, the plants ain't gonna tear you up reaching in there getting those zucchini. It has an even stronger disease package than the Pascola. It's resistant to everything the Pascola is in addition to that papaya ring spot virus that we've talked about before. So all four of those good varieties, those three of them have remarkable disease packages. And then the last thing as far as new stuff, we've talked about some of these and finally got them all on the site so I can talk about all three of them together. Let me kind of sort them here. So these three new watermelons we got, which are all these all sweet types. And we've grown crimson sweet before and we think they're pretty sweet. These are sweeter than crimson sweet. Come on now. Believe it. Ooh. We got three of them. We got Dolce Fantasia, or Sweet Fantasy. We've got the Sangria and we've got the Jamboree. Here, help me hold these up here. And, and I know a lot of people are gonna say, what's the difference between the three? And it's pretty much, as far as I understand it, size. Your Dolce Fantasia is gonna come in around 20 pound watermelon. Your Sangria is gonna come in closer to 25, and your Jamboree gonna be a big old 30 pound watermelon. 
It just depends on what you like as far as size. I think I'm growing the sangria this year. The sangria? Uh, I'm thinking if we got some things in the work uh, down the road, we might grow some of those if we do something down the road, uh, growing some squash trials. But yeah, the sangria, I, uh, that name just... I'm familiar with that variety. That that variety there, I'm 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 familiar with it. The other two, I'm not real familiar. With, but I've I've handled that watermelon before a few years ago. That was a uh, that was one of the go tos before the seedless watermelons came out. That, that was a good commercial variety back before the uh, everybody started wanting seedless. The seedless ones, say 15, 20 years ago, there was a lot of that sangria grown on a commercial level. Now I've heard of the. So, so when you grow the seedless ones, you have to have the pollinizers out there. And the commercial guys, the pollinizers, they don't harvest. They're just kind of junk varieties for the most part. For the most part. Now, they will have some peddlers or some what we call pin hookers go in there right. after they harvest them and harvest some of those seeded varieties. Right. But now I've heard of some of the mar small scale market farmers who really can't afford that kind of waste. They're using the sangria as a pollinizer. As a pollinizer. And so they can actually harvest their pollinizers. I do. Okay, now this week for our main topic on the show, we were going to talk about seed potatoes, but something happened. We about sold out. We about sold out of taters, and so we didn't figure. We figure it would just it would be wrong if we sat up here and talked about all eight varieties of taters we got, and then everybody goes to the site and then they can't order them because they all gone. We're going to do something a little different next year. We're going to start our pre-order earlier so we can accommodate everybody. But I can promise you, keep this in the back of your mind. You need to pre-order your potatoes next year because these things go like crazy when they come in. And we've gotten real, real short on several varieties. Now, that being said, I'm working all my magic I can to try to get some more. I'm making no promises, but if we do get our hands on a few more, we will send out an email blast and let you know what we get. They're going to be limited supply, whatever. And I don't know that we can. I'm just saying there's a possibility we might can. If we do, we'll send it out let you know. Otherwise, we do have Kennebec. We do have Red Northern. We do have Yukon Gold at this moment. Available. Those three, we got the specialty varieties. Uh, Have to go off the shelf. I, I'm not even, one of my favorites, the German Butterball. Uh, we don't even have any of those that I can plant myself in the garden. And uh, we tried to plan ahead. We ordered about three times as many taters as we did last year. And uh, they just they just flew. We'll know next year to order more and more. That we're going to start the pre-sale earlier. Start the pre-sale earlier. So uh, if you got your taters, you know, if you hadn't got them, there's a reason because you live way up north and I'm scared to ship them to you because they're going to freeze. Bear with us. I'm watching the weather every day. And just as soon as I get them taters shipped to you, I'm going to send them to you because you're not going to need them before I can send them to you. So don't stress out. We got your taters and we're looking after you. And uh, I'm not going to get into this too much right here, but uh, I am going to get into it on a video next week about this planting by the moon taters deal. I just I had somebody ask me about that yesterday. Uh, folks, don't wait on the moon to plant your taters. You, your dirt's nice and dry. Plant your taters when you got time to plant your taters. Yeah. All right. So, since we're not doing taters, another timely subject that I've got going on right now is it's time to start tomatoes in the greenhouse. Zone 8 it is February the 15th is the ideal time to get those tomato seeds planted in your trays. And they're going to be coming off in six weeks. It's going to be about the 1st of April. And it's going to be perfect timing to get them in the ground so we got a lot a lot of new tomatoes we did recently add some filtering options on the site so you can separate out indeterminate determinate hybrid and heirloom but i just want to kind of just bump through these just bump through. and uh and, and kind of comment a little bit on each one and, and just show you what we got here and uh, so we're going to start off with the heirloom indeterminate varieties which now, in all honesty, we have a tough time growing down here, but we do like to grow a few of them just because some of them are unique and they just got some, some good flavor profiles. We're going to go through these. First one, we've got Amish Paste. Now, we did, for an heirloom indeterminate down here, that one did pretty good it for did. us last year. I've grown it the last two years in a row. So I would say that one is one of the heirlooms that can handle some of our disease pressure. Yep. Uh, this is a great canning tomato. Makes a nice big Roma type tomato. Really like that. Amish one. paste. This next one here, the brandy wine. I will grow it and have grown it, and you, I can get a few of these nice big ones off there, and they are pretty. 
and they are meaty and they make a fine tomato sandwich. Uh, if you live in an area with, with not as much commercial agriculture around you, you can probably grow the fire out of this one. Cherokee Purple was one of the ones that was, was pretty high up there in our taste test we did last year. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a fine, fine tomato. It doesn't get real big like the Brandywine does, but that's a really, really good eating tomato. I'm getting hungry. Getting hungry. Yellow Pear. Now, these things, you better have your buckets ready when these things get going because you'll be picking and picking and picking on these things. Everybody needs a couple of yellow pears. Let me talk about this just a minute because I had somebody in the seed room the other day when I told them about this here. There's 50 seeds in that pack. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You ain't going to need but two yellow pear tomato plants. So what you do is you buy you a pack of them and you plant off its seeds and you grow those plants and you give them plants away to your neighbors, your friends, and your family and your enemies. And what you're going to do is make everybody happy. But you don't need to keep you about two to three of them because these things will make like crazy. It's an ideal tomato if you're just going to have one or two to go out there and snack off of and put them in your salad. It's got wonderful flavor to them. And it's one of the better pear uh, tomatoes out there I've ever seen. Of course, it's yellow, so that makes it even more better. More better. Another cherry kind of type we just added is called the Sweetie Cherry right here. And this is supposedly one of the sweetest cherry tomatoes out there as the now, name is that an heirloom? yes this is an heirloom and all these are heirloom indeterminate so uh, i'm gonna try some of these this year these sweetie cherries they're supposed to grow in just big old clusters like grapes so looking forward to trying those the next one here heirloom indeterminate and this is one i've heard a lot of people growing i've never tried it personally but i do want to try it's supposed it. to have a really good flavor to it the darker tomatoes have a more kind of complex flavor and i think old tom matthews likes to grow this one i've heard him talk about so yep. it's called black creme and a really popular one and i'm going to try a few of those this next one jubilee i grew last year a nice big yellow tomato has a little more of a citrusy flavor to it, as do yellow and, and orange It did fruits. pretty good in our taste test, I believe. It, it did good, and it actually grew pretty well here, considering, you know, our pressure. This one did all right. This is an AAS winner. It's a good variety. And the last one, which is a real popular one, it's got a lot of, you know, name recognition out there, is the Mortgage Lifter. The name Mortgage Lifter came from way back in the day. A guy was about to lose his little old farm, and he found this variety here and grew them, and it did so well for him that he was able to not lose his farm, hence the name Mortgage Lifter. That's right, that's right. Okay. Now, a little bit on indeterminate tomatoes. You know, we hear a lot of people talk about pruning tomatoes. If you want to prune or suck a tomato, it is the indeterminates you want to do that to. We're fixing to go with the determinants, and that's the ones you do not have to worry about pruning. Well, I got a few more indeterminates. Oh, well, excuse me there. Well, anyhow, you, you're pruning, you're suckering, those would be the indeterminates that you want to prune or sucker out. And you do not want to prune or sucker or have to worry about the determinants. Yeah. So some of these indeterminates, people do what they call a single leader on them. And they'll just keep single stemming them. You can do that on these. Don't do that on your It's confusing because there's so much misinformation out there about sucker and tomatoes. Uh, so those were heirloom indeterminates. We've got a few hybrid indeterminates. This black zebra cherry, which I showed y'all last week. I'm definitely growing that one. That's a good one. The Sun Gold, I gotta grow a few of them. That that won our taste test last year. Yeah, uh, yeah that's a that's, that's a the best taste of right tomato. There. And we got this new one here called Chef's Choice Orange Tomato. And then we have met the folks that actually breed this over in California, and uh, they did a lot of work on this Chef's Choice line. And uh, we decided to go with the orange one. We've heard a lot of good things about them. And uh, I might try a couple of those as well. Okay, so those are all indeterminates. Indeterminates are those tomatoes that grow away like crazy. They just keep, keep growing, growing and keep, keep growing, making. Keep growing. Now we're going to talk about determinants, which are going to have a much narrower production window, but they're going to produce many more tomatoes within that window. More of a bush variety, so you got to worry about them getting 15 to 20 foot tall. You know, you see these advertisements, these people got tomatoes 30, 40 feet high and all this. That's an indeterminate tomato. Yeah, but We're not who, growing tomato vines, we're growing tomatoes. Who wants to get on a ladder and pick tomatoes? I don't, they feel like they're doing something. That ain't a whole lot to me. Yeah. Okay, so determinate. We got one heirloom determinate variety. And... Um, and I guess this is considered an heirloom just because it's been around since the 1950s. And I had, I can't remember what her name was, a lady suggested 
that we carry these is called Homestead Tomato. A uh, pretty simple name there, but this was developed by the University of Florida in the 1950s, and it has some fairly kind of innate bred in uh, disease resistance, supposed to set fruit well in hot areas like Florida. Uh, Hence Oklahoma. the name Homestead. I'm assuming they named that after Homestead, Florida. Yeah. Which is, uh, well, world of your tomatoes are grown in Homestead, Florida. A lot so, of, a lot of so produces. a good heirloom determinant variety there. So you could, if you were the seed saving type, you could do that with those. Now let's get into the ones that we, we grow the most of, which are the hybrid determinant ones. Folks, if you like growing tomatoes for putting up canning sauces, whatever, your hybrid determinants are the ones you want to go with. Surefire guaranteed to make. These are the easiest tomatoes to make and they will guarantee your success if you pick one of these disease resistant varieties. Your plants ain't going to get too big. They're going to they gonna make, make, make in that window. And then you can get them out of there by early July and you plant something else in that spot. So, first one, we've got our Mountain Glory here. Um, from my experiences growing this last year, it, it, I think this one is designed more to gr grow in areas with maybe not quite as much disease pressure. I think well, it would do that, better in a mountain, as well, the name suggests. That particular variety, along with some more of the what they call the mountain series, were developed by NC State by a guy named Dr. Randy. I can't think of Dr. Randy's last name right now. Yeah. But he developed this whole line of mountain series, and these, if you're up in where you have an elevation difference than what we do, more cooler climate, these are probably bred more for that. Disease resist package is real good on it. They don't do as well in the deep south forest as what I think they're going to do more up at the mountain area than uh, Well, than I'll we say have. this. So I did a trial last year in several different locations with the Mountain Glory, the Bella Rose, and the Brick Car. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, at, at my house, the Mountain Glory was perform lesser than the Brickyard and the Bella Rosa. South of here, which is crazy, so south of here, uh, where I was working for another farm, they have zero commercial agriculture around them. It's kind of in the woods by a creek. And the Mountain Glory actually outperformed the Bella Rosa and the Brickyard there. So, wow. So I'm saying, if you don't have a lot of commercial agriculture around you, the, the Mountain Glory is I had the same experience one. with it. The next one is a new one we got this year, and we've had a lot of people calling and asking, do we carry a variety of tomato called Celebrity, which is a popular one. And no, I don't have Celebrity, but I got something even better. So this is a variety called Celebration, which was bred to be a slightly improved variety of the Celebrity. This is supposed to be a really good variety that's resistant to cracking. It's also resistant is, uh, to tobacco mosaic virus and uh, just a really good tomato there. A lot of people like that celebrity and if you like that you're really gonna like the celebrity. And there again remember folks you ain't gotta worry about pruning none of these. And sucker and pruning you ain't gotta worry about any of that. You just put them out there and love them and let them grow. So I had said in the past that the red snapper was our, our uh, was gonna be our most disease resistant tomato but I, yeah. I misspoke. I forgot mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. I was adding one. So this one here is called summer pick and this is pelleted um, let me give you what this is. So this is resistant to the, the tomato spotted wilt virus, which is the one that kind of gets us all. This is nematode resistant. It's resistant to something called tomato apex necrosis. Hmm. So I have not done a lot of research on. Uh, sounds nasty. Yeah, sounds rough. And this one's also resistant to that yellow leaf curl virus. Uh, we had some of that for the last couple yeah. years in our in our gardens. This variety here is also known to be a good one for patios or containers. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely going to grow that summer pick there. The next one we got is this, uh, which you won't find. I have, then that's why I picked this one, a hybrid determinate Roma type. Most of your Roma type tomatoes are heirloom indeterminate. But instead of planting the Amish paste this year, like I have for the last two years, I'm going to switch over and I'm going to plant that one. Yeah. Uh, and go with the determinant, with the disease resistant, it's resistant to root knot nematode and uh, tomato spotted wilt virus. Then we got the red snapper, which we've been talking about a lot, has a really good disease package. It's also resistant to that yellow leaf curl virus, and if you've had that, you know exactly what it looks like. 
And a red snapper, whoever named that, did a wonderful job. That just sounds good, mm -hmm. don't it? And a lot, some people have been asking about the size on these. All of these are are your good slicing tomatoes. Now, they're going to get as big as some of those naughty-looking heirloom tomatoes, but all these going to fit nice in the palm of your hand. You're probably going to need, if you got a big slice light bread, you may have to get you two slices of this covered up completely. If you grow tomatoes like Trav does. Now, if you grow tomatoes <laughs> like I do, one slice will normally do it. Huh. Hmm. Hmm, how about that? All right. Brickyard. The last two. Brickyard. These are the two that did best for us last year, but we're gonna we're gonna test a snap. I think the they pick. deserve to be tested again. I don't think we should draw a huge amount of confidence off of one year of trials. I think they deserve to be trialed again to oh, see yeah, if they yeah. can out Well, because la again. last year was could be a little bit of a temperature or weather anomaly because it got hot so it quick. It did. It did. And it was just rough. We had on the it. hottest May we've had in a long it time. It was just rough on everything. Yep. But uh, the Bella Rose is the one we've been growing for a long, um, 10 years or so, long, long time. Just a, an awesome, awesome variety. The Brickyard, uh, we tried it for the first time last year and uh, really, it did really well. Both of these. And almost all of these have germination rates of 95% or more. This says 97. If there was one variety last year that really blew me away, it was the Brickyard. Yeah. And it, I mean, when I say blew me away, it outperformed my expectations. And a lot of people will ask, well, you always talk about the disease resistance and the production, how do they taste? Folks, all these varieties here taste really, really good. There's, it's nothing like a tomato you're gonna go buy at a grocery store. And, and if you haven't seen that video, you can go back in the row by row archives where we did the taste test last year. And a lot of these varieties here won the taste test over the uh, heirloom varieties. Yeah, now there's some varieties out there that have disease resistance, don't taste worth a toot. And I'm going to tell you which ones they are. That Amelia, which has a good disease package to it, stay away from it. It has zero flavor to me compared to these two. We ain't even going to care to none of them that taste like that. That Amelia to me. I didn't really, that Tasty Lee, I didn't really care about no, it. I didn't care for you a lot either. Nope. Uh, but, but yeah, we ain't going to care tomatoes that don't taste good. That's right, because that's what it's about. A good If you can't make a good tomato sandwich off of it, you have wasted your time and our time because it ain't no good. That's right. All right. So if you have any other questions about tomatoes, if you've got some varieties that we haven't investigated yet, put those in the comments and we're always looking at adding them. There was one I didn't get added this year because it was a crop failure, one called Arkansas Traveler that a lot of people suggested. Um, but, but if you've got some good ones out there, let me know what they are and I'll be glad to add them. I ain't got my quick, I'm gonna have to share it with you. Okay. So let's get to some questions. And if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to custserve at hosttools.com and we'll send you a nice little prize. Colleen Baker asks, I have a question about pellet disease. Do I need to treat pellet disease any differently than non pellet seeds when seed starting? I have tried pellet seeds twice now and have had terrible luck with germination. Ah. Uh, I don't know this for sure, but in my mind, I think with pelleted seeds, it, they might need a little bit more water to break through that clay and kind of penetrate and get to that seed. I haven't really noticed that. That's just kind of something in the back of my mind. I don't really have anything to prove that, and I haven't really noticed that they germinate slower than the other. A lot of our pelleted seeds, those tomatoes we just showed, you can get them things up in three days. Our we lettuce, have, you can get up in three or four days. We have been told in the past that pelleted seeds don't have quite the shelf life that unpelleted seeds do. So if some of these companies out there that don't move many seeds may hold seeds over from year to year, you may have gotten some older seeds may have been a little bit of an issue. We move enough of them out of here, they get out of here quick. And we don't keep seeds, they just get out of here. And we, we move through a lot of seeds, so we keep fresher seeds in there may have a difference. Yeah, yeah. If, if fresh pelleted seeds should germinate well for you. We'll say that. Okay, next one is from Jace Boutwell, and he says, I've seen on your website how the Jimmy Red corn was an heirloom. What's your best opinion or method on preserving corn seed for next season? Okay, if you're gonna save your seed, now, this is general, not necessarily Jimmy Red, which I think is a great variety. This is general. The isolation footage Normal recommendation on corn is 1,600 feet. 
So 1,600 to, I'm going to say, 3,500 feet, you want to keep those varieties away from one another to keep from cross-pollination. Because if you're going to save seed, you're doing that to save a particular variety. So you don't want them to cross-pollinate. 1,600 to 3,200 feet away from each variety. All right, after you gather those seeds, you want to put them in the freezer. You want to do something to keep the weevils out of them because weevils are notorious for getting in corn seed. And what we do and have done in the past is take those corn seed, bag them up and put them in the freezer for about two weeks. And that what that does is that busts that cycle from that corn weevil. And then you can normally take them out and put them in room and temperature. Busts it? Busts the, the cycle. In other words, it breaks it. <laughs> anyway, you take, take that cycle away from that bud. Then you can normally at room temperature, you'll be okay. You want to leave me in the refrigerator, that's fine too. But you got to, you got to put them, you can fumigate them. And I have used some stuff called false tops before. But it's so much easier if you got room in your freezer, just put them in your freezer. And it's easier to shell it before you put it in the freezer. Yes, it is. It take a lot well, yeah. in this much yeah. room. Okay. All right. And now, Travis, one for you from old Empty Nester Homestead. He said, I love cucumbers. I get white mildew on my plants every year, and they'll be dead within a week. Zone 6, northern Ohio, with lake effect. I water at the roots only and keep the bottom leaves trimmed for better airflow. I grow them on a trellis. Any ideas how to prevent mildew? Well, I meant to bring one of these packets, but it, I didn't. So, you're probably going to need to grow one of these powdery mildew resistant varieties. And we got two of them. We got the Diomede, if you want a slicer. That Diomede is a fine, fine cucumber as far as the disease resistant package. Uh, and then we've got that Max Pack if you want a pickler. Uh, you know, if. If you've got disease problem, folks, no matter if you're in northern Ohio or northern Florida or wherever, you can fight it if you want to, but the best thing is to get you a good variety that has some built-in disease resistant, and that's going to help you be successful. We also have a product out there that works as far as a curative powder meal do. Bicarb. Biocarb. And you can you can put that on there. If you're going to use it, you definitely need to use it pretty regular. I mean, it's not a one-time hit thing. Hit it pretty often, at least every five days, if you know you're going to have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Last one here is from Brian Sherman. He says, this will be my first year growing corn, and I bought the peaches and cream variety. What is special about corn? I know they need a lot of fertilizer, but how, when, what kind? I always heard my pawpaw say he needed some sodium of nitrate. Pawpaw was always right. There's three things that I really enjoy the most growing in my garden. One of them is watermelons, one of them is tomatoes, and the other one is corn. I just love to grow corn. I love to, you could, they say, and it's true, you go out there on a still afternoon when it gets about waist high, and you can actually stand there and listen to it pop and grow. Corn is fun to grow. It's a little bit challenging to some people because they don't understand how you grow corn. Corn takes a lot of water, takes a lot of fertilizer, and if you ever get yellow corn, you're doing something a little bit wrong. You want to keep it green as a gourd. Now, I've often said, you know when you got enough fertilizer to corn because you burnt the edge of that leaf just a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's when you know you got it right. Soda of nitrate is the exact same thing as Chilean nitrate or organic nitrate, which we carry. Which or bulldog soda. Or, well, the bulldog soda is a thing in the past, but that's exactly what he was talking about. But it is a great source. You want to put down a, this is the way I do it. I put down a balanced fertilizer, whether it be 10, 10, 10, 16, 16, 16, 20, 20, 20, a 333 manure, anything that's balanced. And every other time I hit it with a nitrogen source. So I go with a balanced fertilizer, then I go with a straight nitrogen source. I go back with a balanced fertilizer and a straight nitrogen source. If you want to do the math and get, you know, it takes five to seven pounds of pure in per thousand square feet to make a crop of corn. Takes a lot of it. So uh, you got to have it green, you got to have it growing, and it'll do wonderful for you. Most times I see two problems with people growing corn. They don't use enough fertilizer and they plant it in these long rows, one or two rows. You got to keep corn planted in blocks. It's pollinated by the wind and you got to keep it in these blocks. So when the wind blows and it starts tasseling, it's going to pollinate fine. Grow you some nice peaches and cream. When it comes in, go up there and pull it off that stalk. Eat it raw. Ooh, it's good stuff. All right, all I right, I make myself right. sick off of it every year. Yeah, good stuff. All right, folks, if you have any more questions, put those in the comments. People, you need to be getting your tater dirt ready. You need to be cutting up your taters. I, I spent two hours last night. I cut up about 80 pounds Boy, of taters. that's good. That's good meditation Sat there, time. I, I wore a blade slap doll on my bench made knife cutting up taters. I like to do it with my dog sitting there looking at me. Yeah. Uh, my dogs was asleep on the couch when I was doing yeah. it. But uh, I get your taters cut up. 
it's time to plant taters and we'll be doing that in some videos next week hope you guys enjoyed the show as always don't keep us a secret hit that like button hit that thumbs up button and share the video and we will see you next time take care